Salam everybody, welcome to the Samoa Network. Um, we're a group of Afghans who come together monthly to discuss issues that are concerning our community. Um, this week we have a really awesome panel for you all and a really uh, interesting topics that we're going to be addressing today. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and quickly introduce ourselves and just kind of go around and say who we are and where we're calling in from. And then we'll go ahead and get started on talking about what our topic of today is going to be. So first of all, my name is Omar Aziz. And I'm here from Fremont, California. And then we'll move to my left, and I have Saba next. Salam, everybody. It's um, Saba Mohir. I'm from the Bay Area. And Reza John. Salam, everyone. My name is Reza. I'm from Southern California. And Reza John. Salam, I'm Nura, calling from Durham, North Carolina. And Medina. Salam everyone, I'm Medina calling from Los Angeles. Gina. Salam everyone, my name is Gina Karimi. I am currently calling in from Los Angeles, California. Dawood. How's it going every everyone? Sorry, lost my voice there. Dawood from Orange County. And Ali B. Hey, Salam. Uh, my name is Ali Baluch. I'm based out of Los Angeles, but tonight I'm calling in from New York City. Ali, oh. Salam, everyone. I'm Ali, and I'm calling from Orange County. Hey, Afifa. Assalamualaikum, everybody. My name is Afifa Saman. I'm calling in from San Diego. Awesome. So uh, these are our awesome panelists. We're very lucky to have some folks here um, who uh, aren't our regular people who are on with us. So I'm very excited for what they can contribute and what they can bring. Uh, we have some bios on the Facebook page if you want to like learn more about some of the backgrounds that the people are bringing here today. Um, but tonight's discussion is going to talk about uh, misrepresentation or representation in our community. So um, recently discussions have been around depictions of Afghans in the media and uh, specifically regarding uh, a, a movie that just came out um, called Rock the Kasbah that we want to touch on, and as well as some um, depictions that have been come across in reality television. So uh, we have some discussions around those things, and we thought it was a good opportunity to talk about this. We felt that people in our community were discussing these issues, and we wanted to use those two particular things to kind of frame our discussion tonight. Uh, so we're just going to jump right in and get started uh, real quickly. So. Uh, the first thing is that we have the film The Rock the Cosmos starring Bill Murray that came out uh, just about last week. Uh, recently there were some screenings in LA and the Bay Area uh, to uh, predominantly Afghan American audiences uh, asking about our opinions and feedback on things and we wanted to kind of bring that discussion to this, um, to this forum as well. Uh, so if someone wants to just kind of talk about, um, you know, maybe just briefly give us a, a, a a synopsis of the film, if anyone uh, can remember what that film was about. But basically, it's uh, Bill Murray going into Afghanistan uh, based off of the Afghan star um, television show. And um, he goes there, helps this woman out to uh, go on to compete in the contest, and she becomes one, a finalist. But we have a trailer on the Facebook event page that I encourage all of you to check out if you haven't had a chance to. But um, I just wanted to ask the panel, what were your reactions to the film, and what are some of the reactions that you're hearing from other people um, after seeing that film? Um, it was, uh, I don't know, you know, uh, I, I went in, I, I was, from the trailer, I just kind of knew it wasn't going to be like, it wasn't going to be something that Afghans would walk away proud of, you know, and not that we had any hand in it, um, but... It, it didn't, you know, it wasn't at, like one of those offensive films. It didn't paint us as barbaric. I mean, to the degree that, like, American Sniper painted, like, the Arab and Muslims, you know? So um, there were, like, you, you try to look for the positives, but, you know, it, it just kind of, like, um, fell a little short, you know? And, and for someone to write about Afghanistan and the Afghans who never went to Afghanistan, you know? And, and I don't... And I'm not sure if the director even took the time to go out to Afghanistan, you know, because the writer said he for sure didn't go. Um, so, I mean, there are like, you know, I feel very two ways on it, you know, that, okay, awesome, thank you for focusing on, like, the minor things on, like, corruption and war profiteering, like, like how Americans are profiting off war and, you know, and some other aspects, but, you know, 
the underlying, like, using Afghanistan as, you know, like, someone brought it up at the screen, which I'm glad that they did, that it was had White Savior all, written all over it, you know, and you can argue that it was, you know, uh, he, uh, Bill Murray was the one needing saving, and it, he was an anti-hero, blah, 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 sure, whatever, if you want to look at it that way, but you, they still used Afghanistan as, like, a gag, as a prop, you know, so um, they used the country just for laughs, instead of, like, really pushing anything. Like, this story, this film could have taken place anywhere. They could have, like, literally done this film in rural America, and it still would have been the same exact thing, you know? But, like, to get the gags and laughs, they had to, like, mock... I mean, not really mock the Afghans, but, you know... And then my biggest issue outside of all of that was, like, how are you going to do a film on Afghans about in Afghanistan and not have, like, only have two Afghans? in the entire film, you know, and play minor roles. I don't even know where the second, Af I don't know who the second Afghan was. I know Fahim uh, played the father, but I don't know, because they said there were two Afghans, so I don't know who that second Afghan uh, actor was, but come on, like, really, you're going to, like, cast Iran, like, this is where a representation comes in, you know, you're going to cast Iranians and Pakistanis and Arabs as Afghans, you know, I, but that was my major concern. Sorry for rambling a bit too much, but yeah. No, you're good. Does anyone? I know that there were some what mixed reactions to the film. Does anyone want to touch on what some other folks were saying? I know that there was kind of the um, the negative portrayal, but I know that some people did not necessarily see it that way, and I thought it was kind of a mixed bag. So if anyone wants to touch on that, but I know though you had something you wanted to add. Yeah. Um, honestly, I went into the, the movie with like not expecting anything like I was like whatever I'm just gonna go in there and hope it's not as bad as like what other movies make like Muslims and Afghans look and the more I kept watching it the more I was getting disappointed it wasn't as bad as like I I was anticipating the worst just like in my head I was like all right I could expect a few things here and there it didn't get to that level but I think for me like Salman said it perfectly like he left a comment somewhere saying that it was the panel that kind of frustrated me. Like, we had, like, a, the writer there who kind of was like, yeah, we're showing Afghan hospitality and this and that. And I'm like, no, you're having a guy threaten to kill someone if he doesn't come to his house for tea. That's not being hospitable. That's making Afghans look like angry, like, Middle Eastern people. I think it was the whole, like, concept of them wanting us to thank them for putting Afghans on, like, a movie screen that kind of rubbed me the wrong way. That was just my biggest thing out of the, the screening. And so for those that may have not been at the at the screening or at the panel discussion, we had some of the writers from the film and some of the actors and um, I believe Mitch Glazer, who's one of the writers of the film, uh, who were there and were speaking to a group of Afghan Americans, and I think Dawood is touching on that, um, as well as the fact that there were a lot of, like I said, there was a mixed bag, and I, there were some folks who did feel like it was... Um, uh, I guess you could say better than what they'd seen before, and I think that there were some people who felt that it was, um, you know, something we sh could still stand behind because it, you know, didn't depict us in, in, in kind of that frame of, like, you know, we're terrorists and we're this and we're that. Um, Ali Baluch, as somebody who's, you know, in Hollywood, who works in the industry, you know, can you tell us kind of a little bit more on, like, you know, what we can, what if if you know some a lot of folks are unhappy who talk spoke to us about why we're unhappy. Why why do you think that? Why does that happen? Why do these portrayals come out come about the way that they do? And if there are some things we can do to kind of change that, or what should we do as a community? As someone who has insight into the industry, I think if you could just kind of share with us what your thoughts are. Yeah, for sure. Um, this is like a problem with every other you know marginalized um immigrant community you know um or any people of color, you know, you have your blacks, your Asians, your, your Latinos, and they're all going through the same problem of representation. We don't, you know, it's all these, like, you go into a writer's room, right, if you, for any TV show, any TV show, you go into a room where it's, like, 10 to 15, maybe even 20 writers are all sitting in, like, round table, and they're all white. Majority is white male, right? So it's, like, to have our voices, there's this one girl, um, she, I don't think she was able to make AAC, I don't know how involved she is, her name is Ohmaira Hamdi, and she, a um, student in Orange County, uh, lives in Irvine, but she was an intern at um, Fox, 20th Century Fox. And she, like, you can't really choose where you, you're thrown into a department, and she was put into um, the show The Tyrant, which is 
extremely racist, you know, but for her, it's a job, it's an opportunity to get a foot in the door. And, you know, she was sitting there, and they were making, she was saying that um, in the writer's room, they were trying to draw this plot line of, um, and she made, like, this Facebook post, like, detailed the story, and the writers were trying to, like, write this scene, this, this story out, and it was just extremely inaccurate and offensive to Muslims. And to have her in the room to be like, hey, that's not how it is, you know, this is how it is. They completely threw that script out and started all over from scratch just because Homaira was in that room to be like, it doesn't work like that, you know, like, that's offensive. So for us to have that voice, we need our creatives to be there. We need, you know, for like, um, there's a, a clip of Lee Daniels, the guy who, um, does um, his show The uh, Empire, it's like huge on Fox, he had like this roundtable discussion with all these other writers and he was like, he was like, I hate when white people write for black characters, right? Because white people will never understand the struggles and whatever that black people go through. So like, how are you going to write for a black character? And same thing, like we can't have white people writing for Afghans. Like you don't know, you know, unless you like, some, unless you're like some Steve McCurry, like you're living in Afghanistan with the Afghans for years and years, studying the culture of like, you know, not appropriating, but appreciating it and doing it in the right way where you can actually represent. But, you know, um, I feel like to have our voices heard, we need to be in those rooms. You know, we need to like definitely drive um, to have a presence there, you know, because cause somebody else is going to write for us. You know, if we don't write our narrative, and you know what? Even if you don't want to like get into like mainstream Hollywood, you can do independent films and create that narrative for yourself instead of letting somebody else tell that story. We need to invest. There are so many talented, you know, um, young Afghan filmmakers, older Afghan filmmakers. Uh, before we started the the thing, we joked that there's this guy, um, this Afghan French filmmaker. His name um, Barmak Akram. He did um, uh, uh, Wajma an Afghan love story. That's on Netflix. You know and he financed it independently. He got it up on Netflix, which, you know, it's hard for anyone to do because it takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of effort. And we don't have that, like, you know, that foundation where we can, like, come to the community like, hey, you guys, I have this project um, and I need funding because that's how things are made. You know, you got to hire a crew. You got to hire an editor and a writer and a producer and cinematographer and the lights and audio and all that costs money, you know, to, like, makes uh, pay the actors so um, I think we need to invest in our community and then just encourage you know um, the ones who are passionate about the arts to go into the arts so we can have you know um, a place on that in that table go ahead uh, Ali Alumi uh, thanks. I agree with with Ali Baluch. I think he's he's right on. What I've noticed, and this is both in Rock the Casbah and other depictions, is that race and difference, when it's portrayed in the media, isn't about representation. It's about a plot device, mainly against white characters. So in in uh, Rock the Casbah, one of the things that frustrated me is, I can take the movie as a comedy, but when we're told that it's meant to be representation, and yet all the Afghan characters have no agency and our plot devices for Bill Murray's redemption, then that's a problem, right? Um, and the only way we can change that is to support the representation we have out there, to get the creatives in the writing positions, and also to work across fields. One of the things that we need to do is support our public figures, the ones, the few ones that are out there, um, support them to the best that we can, and then most importantly, work across fields. It's not all about Hollywood. It's about people who are social media famous. It's about people who are um, working in politics in all these different fields working closely together. We are a minority group within another minority. Afghans are a small representation of the Middle East and Islam. But we don't need to be big to be influential and to have our voices heard. We just need to work together and work tirelessly against these forms of representation. Uh, so one of the things we've been touching on is like the stereotypes and that were depicted in the film. And uh, just a question for you know is is what a how does that change if the stereotypes are are like you know Ali Belushi pointed out that a lot of the writers are white 
um, writers. And so what happens when they are from our community or they talk about, you know, we have these consultants and we have these folks that are kind of helping us out, or maybe they're just actual writers. Um, yeah. How does that change the, the conversation? You know, you're always going to, even within the community, you're always, there, there's always going to be a problematic, you know, um, person that might not have the views of everybody. You know, I don't want to name any names, but at our screening, someone brought up the issue of racism at the LA screening, and, you know, one of the rep representatives of the community that was on the panel didn't really address it and actually went to kind of say that racism doesn't really exist and victim blame, you know, and nothing against the person at all, but it's like there are some things that, you know, um, you can, I can go to like, um, you know, I can write a, a white person can write a script and then hand it off to some Afghan shmo and be like, oh, I had an Afghan guy look over it, you know, and it's like, wait, but like, who is he, what is his qualifications, you know, like, uh, and I feel like Ali Olami would actually be definitely the, the better person to address this issue, you know, um, but yeah, because I feel like he can definitely articulate it uh, in, in a much better way, but you know, even though that this you know someone writes it and then gives it to our community to look over I think it, it can't just go in the hands of like one or two people you know if we're gonna write it if I was to write a script on Afghanistan I'm not gonna just write it and be like hey this is the end all be all this is like the answer you know I'm gonna have to like go through communities do like you know the right way is like kinda have small town hall meetings have people's opinions like hey did I get this right you know but um I Sadly, I have to step out now. I really wanted to um, um, be more a part of this conversation, and I really want to thank you all for having me, and, and um, I apologize for my short time, um, but I, I must head out right now. I'm so sorry, you guys. We thank you, Ali John, for joining us. That was awesome that we had you here as somebody who is uh, you know, working in this industry, and we'll definitely have some of those links and some info on some of the work that you've done so we can support you and continue to like you know see your growth and see your development as somebody who's representing us well and doing the right thing in the community so we definitely appreciate, appreciate all the best man oh thank you guys so much all right take care you guys and so what um, Ali was briefly touching on is kind of the fact that you know sometimes you might have people in the community who are um, who are writing some of the so a lot of uh, you know we look at Rock the Cosmos as a comedy film and you know it was there was an article that was written by an Afghan writer talking about how you know the film co opts stereotypes into you know making this a, a film that was that I guess worked and, and sending a positive message. I mean you look at comedians like you know Dave Chappelle, Keen Peel, who are you know oftentimes you know addressing a lot of these stereotypes and um, I don't know if someone just wants to jump in and talking about you know Nura John if you want to jump in talking about you know participating in sometimes these these systems and you know at where like Sometimes we think that if you're part of a minority group, you um, it, it, you kind of get the green light on on some of these things. Or if anyone else wants to jump on that, Reza, go for it. And then we'll get to Nora right after. Oh, okay, we'll go to Nora first. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Nora John. Sure. I mean, I think that the Chappelle example you bring up, Omar John, is is really when you when you listen to Chappelle's interviews and talk about his struggle of being on the media. It's one thing is that as as that we have to think about is that um, our pe like when Chappelle just talks, he talks about are they laughing with me or at me, right? So is he playing up the part of like this minstrel, like these stereotypes? I mean, there's agency in him being there, right? But this is such an institution, like institutionalized racism isn't just within the political sphere, right? It really permeates within the media system, right? And so when we are getting involved, we have individual agency in terms of being in the writer's room, but collectively, how are we pushing the system? Are we really, is one person's voice enough to really push it and have us bring about positive depictions? So I think that's a real tension that we have to really unpack and think about, because Ali Baluch brought up that there's, there's independent means. You can do independent films, or you can go into Hollywood, and I think there's merit in both, but we have to acknowledge that there's a tension and that these, that the, the micro and macro levels of like stereotypes that exist have been around since the foundation of Hollywood as a cinema, right? And knowing that history, it's a really long, a hard history to un, uh, to break through um, and untangle. Um, I kind of want to actually to build off of uh, what uh, Ali John was saying when he said that we need to support each other. Um, it's 
one thing to believe that a person, the, the person who wrote that article from Huffington Post, it's one thing to believe that they, um, or anybody who takes a script and they're considered a consultant about the culture that the script is discussing. That person may or may not believe in the stereotypes that they're okay. More likely than not, they believe strongly in their own careers. And they know that if they do not okay the stereotypes that are in that script, they are probably not going to get another script given to them. And so what they're focused on, and rightly so or rightly not so, I don't know, but what they're far more focused on instead of representation is their own careers and being able to make a living in this creative industry when all of the men and women who hold the uh, purse strings are white and don't necessarily share their views about how to correctly represent any culture. And so when you see um, someone like Lee Daniels uh, having the ability and the power to uh, address black representation in the face of many white showrunners and white directors, that is not just uh, powerful, but it's also inspiring, and it's something that we, uh, as the Afghan community, we should aspire to have that kind of level. Now, the thing is, to get there, you have to support each other. And one man's voice is not enough, one woman's voice is not enough to do anything, because that person who is sitting there at their desk in their crappy LA apartment, just barely getting a script to do consulting, let alone uh, acting jobs or whatever, if they take a stand and they are not given um, the support that they need, then they have no incentive to continue taking a stand. If they take that stand and then there's no safety net, whether that safety net is Afghan in nature or white in nature or whatever, then there's no incentive for them to continue taking that stand. And so if we want to have men and women in the industry, in the Hollywood industry, represent us correctly, and become the future Lee Daniels of our community, then we need to support them. Instead of nitpicking them and tearing them down, of which there are many examples within our community, we need to stand behind them steadfastly. So I think that's building off of what Ali John said. Uh, and I'm going to get to uh, Gina John next, um, but I also wanted to say, um, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to post it on the Facebook page and um, we'll do our best to answer them. So if you have anything you want to add or share, want to kind of engage in kind of a dialogue while we're speaking, feel free to post on the Facebook page. But I'll go ahead and move to Gina. Um, Salam, everyone. So I did attend the SoCal screening of Rock the Cosba a few weeks ago. And um, I don't know if it's just I'm not as analytical or whatever, but as I was watching the movie, I didn't see all of that, or a lot of the racism that people brought up until after you guys brought it up. I enjoyed the movie. I know there are people in my club that enjoyed the movie. Um, my main problem was, of course, that you know there weren't that many Afghans in the film except for one guy that I know of. Um, but it wasn't that bad. It was just a little boring, and I would blame that mostly on like the writing. Towards the end, it got a little long. But um, my question was, so... We, this is actually the first movie that I've seen that doesn't completely make Afghans look, you know, like terrorists or whatever. So it is a step in the right direction. I'm still trying to be positive about it. And do you guys think that, like I heard at the NorCal screening that it didn't go as well, do you think experiences like that will make the filmmakers not want to reach out in the future? Because he thought he was doing a good job. He's like, you know, I reached out to my friend who owns Tolo or whatever, and he gave the script to a Pashtun scholar, that's what he called him, and he thought the script was fine. So do you think maybe people in Afghanistan aren't as familiar with this like representation? Maybe there's a language barrier? Like what else can we do? Can is it too much to expect them to do that? Or does anyone have thoughts on that? <laughs> Sorry, it's kinda of open ended. Go ahead, Sava. Um, so I have a lot of thoughts on this, but I wanna kind of address your question first, you know, John. Um, so I know that the director he he wanted to have that film screening to, I mean, it was kind of, the way it was 
depicted to us was that he wanted to get our feedback. But what it turned out to be, what it seemed like to me was he really just wanted like a two thumbs up from Afghans. And I'm sorry, but I hold I hold a lot of different things to higher standards, and that includes Hollywood. Um, we are a community who, for the past decade, have been in a controversial place where we've been trying to defend our identity and not be depicted as terrorists, right? So, I mean, while it's a positive thing that we weren't per se vilified, I wouldn't sit here and celebrate this film and, and, and glorify it to be something that we've come a long way. It takes small steps, but I think that they could have done better. And Ali Baluch and others have pointed out that, you know, I mean, for starters, have more, if you have Afghan lead roles, then reserve those roles for Afghans to play them. And that didn't happen. We had one. I have no clue either who the second one was. Um, and, you know, that's like, that's like the first thing. And, and that's like a general problem across the board when it comes to um, that industry, the entertainment industry, is that we have very few minority lead roles to begin with. And, um, and that's a problem. And it does require encouragement on our part. But the other thing that I was thinking about as, you know, people were responding was, um, you know, it's important that we encourage, you know, our artists to, you know, our artists and our writers and anybody who wants to ex excel and succeed in that industry to the utmost. But at the same time, we have to recognize that it is not that easy, um, given the position that they have, to reach, you know, reach a status where they can actually, you know, be successful in that field. There's still, I don't want to, I don't know what the term would be, but there's kind of like a glass ceiling. I know that's more a terminology that you deal with in terms of women in the workplace, but I feel like minorities have a very similar um, experience when they're trying to break the entertainment industry, and, and that's the reality. It's not necessarily that we don't have writers, and we don't have actors, and we don't have filmmakers. I'm, I'm positive that we do, and we're still a young generation. Um, we, we're a generation of immigrants and refugees, and so we're, we're building our foundation here, but it's going to take a lot, and it's not just encouragement on our part, but it's also to push and challenge the entertainment industry and hold them accountable when they're not um, when they're not you know portraying us in a, in a light that we that we're pleased with. One of the comments that was constantly made um, at the screening was, "Write your own narratives. Write your own narratives. Write your own nar narratives." While I agree that that is incredibly important and I encourage that, I don't think that that's the that that's the way to respond to our outrage and our disappointment and how we're portrayed in a film. Um, because that if we don't voice those concerns, I don't think that I, I don't think that anybody in those positions of power who can who can write the films and who can make the films will will do anything different. So right. yes, be respectful, but I think it doesn't mean to be silent when we're we're not okay with how we're being portrayed. Right, and actually, um, now that you mentioned that, I just remembered, I know of two Afghan friends of mine who actually auditioned for roles in the film. Uh, one was for the girl, I forget her name, the main girl, um, but she didn't know why. She It's because she thinks they wanted someone younger, or um, also like her agent kind of locked it in, so Hollywood politics. And then um, for the role of the host of Sitare Avalon, one of my friends should have gotten the role, but he said that, like, oh, you know, they wanted this other guy to get it. Like, politics, again, he's, like, not Afghan. And he actually told me that they wanted someone uglier for the role because I guess it's not believable that Afghans are good-looking people. Yeah. So, wow. I don't know. Yeah. I think um, I just wanted to add, like, to go off of what Sabo John was saying, like, in terms of that glass ceiling and in terms of, like, having expectations of Hollywood, I don't think none of us are going to be happy until it's really us doing the writing and it's really us being behind the, you know, the, the projects and stuff. Like, we can expect or we can try and we can sit at the table and have discussions and and want more from Hollywood, but no one is going to have the same fire and passion to make us look good like we do, because what sells is the stereotype. Like, like that's what people are going to want to see, and that's what's hot. Like, they want to see that 
they, they wanted to see this like poor little Pashtun girl being saved like white people are into that stuff they want those stereotypes to be like real and like tangible so of course they're gonna they're gonna want or, or Hollywood is gonna want to you know budget movies like that it's not gonna happen until we do it ourselves and it can start off being like indie productions or or whatever the case may be um, you know, like like I went to a screening. Salman John invited us. Um, I went to a screening this week, and it was it was a documentary called Frame by Frame, and it was completely different. Um, it was a documentary, so so it was all real. Um, but we were the Afghans that did attend were so much happier with the depictions of Afghans because it was real and it wasn't scripted and it really humanized Afghans and the the two directors who were behind it were they were not Afghans they were American women but they consulted Afghans they were working side by side with Afghans the entire time they actually went to Afghanistan um, so so it, it showed a really different like it showed a really different aspect than Rock the Kasba because it was real, so we. I just, I just feel like we can't expect Hollywood to try to like cater to, to what we're trying to do, is basically my thing. Am I saying that we shouldn't like, uh, keep pushing for it and ex and and want that? No, we should definitely still be there. We should definitely still be voicing our frustrations. I think it's completely fine that we reacted. We were angry at, at the Rock the Cosba um, screenings, and I think that that's fine. Um, so I think yeah, we should still be doing that, and we should still definitely make a make a presence and everything. But at the same time, it's not going to happen until like like we're the ones directing, we're the ones screenwriting and and acting and doing all of that. So um, thank you for for that exchange. That was really uh, that was really awesome. So <laughs> I just also wanted to add. I think we're bringing up questions of kind of you know who's. Whose responsibility is it in terms of these portrayals, and like you know, who 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 is the one that um, is responsible for making sure that our portrayals are positive or whatever they may be? And also thinking about who has control and the power over those portrayals is something we have to um, think about when we're when we're deciding that. Uh, the next thing I wanted to to just kind of move on to when it comes to representation is um, talking. To, we've talked about a Hollywood film, kind of the big screen, so we're gonna kind of transition a little bit into the small screen uh, with uh, some some tele uh, depictions that happened on television and Medina John you wrote an article that got a lot of attention with especially within the Afghan community um, and if you could it was entitled the mean girls of Afghanistan on your uh, burgers and beer blog uh, if you want to just kind of tell us a little bit about um, the article you wrote and just kind of what inspired you or what sparked you to write that Sure. Um, yeah, so I had always wanted to um, write something like that, and it really kind of started from, like, seeing comments on um, Ariana Saeed's page, on her Instagram page. Um, so it would be, like, really mean, nasty comments that were, like, sexist or derogatory. Um, so that was always in the back of my mind. And then also experiences with, like, even my cousin Shabnam, who is, like, an insta-famous makeup artist, basically. Um, and she would get like really mean nasty comments too on her page so I would see the same types of comments like directed towards Afghan women who were in the spotlight and like chose to dress a certain way which it which isn't really provocative or anything like that it was just they were out there they were putting themselves out there um, and they were met with with hostility for that and then it all came together when I saw the reaction to Durrani Popal's premiere on the Dash Dolls. So my article basically was kind of like my observation and like it was it was honestly really me checking myself and checking the judgment that I projected on her. Because off the bat when I watched it, my entire thing was like um, my my entire concern was she didn't really come out and say that she was Afghan. So when she didn't do that, like off the bat, I was annoyed, and I was just like, like, why, why is she trying to like hide it? Or and I was coming from like a place of anger, so I was like, why is she trying to hide it? And like, why is she trying to pass off like she's Persian or yada yada? Could E, which is I think I think it's uh, E is the channel that that does that show. Could they have uh, made it seem like that? Could they have cut out the scenes that she did say she's Afghan? Maybe I don't know, but the way that it came off was like. I felt like because Persians are a more like accepted um, 
subculture, I guess. Like she was just trying to like, you know, go in with them or whatever. So that was, that was like my initial judgment and I was upset. Um, and then so, so I got the inspiration to write the article because I kind of voiced that and then the judgments just came from like all sides and it wasn't only people that I knew, it was on Instagram, on Twitter, people were writing things on her Twitter, like mean horrible things because of her choices, you know, she, she chose to date a Jew and put that on the reality show, she, she goes to clubs and, and, and it's on the reality show. So people were upset from like, for like a wide range of things, people were like saying like anything, it could be that she's not smart, it could be that she's dressing a certain way, whatever it was. So, and then also, of course, her working under the Kardashians, which people have a problem with because of what whatever reasons. But I got inspired because when I saw all of those comments, it made me realize why she might not want to say that she's Afghan. Because if she has been getting this, because she was already Instagram famous even before the show, if she was already meeting this type of hostility just for being a girl who's out there, why would you want to say that you're Afghan? Why would you want to deal with the repercussions of stating your ethnicity when the people who are a part of your group don't really want to, you know, they don't really want to support you? So, so the entire, like, I guess, I guess what it comes down to is the entire inspiration for that was like, I'm not saying we should support or, or not support whatever lifestyle a reality, an Afghan reality TV star wants to live. I just feel like because our community is small and because these comments can go back to that person, we need to be like, we need to be hypersensitive to what, to the way that we say things about Afghan women who choose to live their lives in the public eye. Because as much as people want to act like they have, you know, like, like they're strong and they can be out there, it's going to hurt them. And after the article, I actually had a conversation with Durrani and she did say, you know, like, I, I get this kind of stuff all the time. People attack me all the time. So I don't even, I just stay away from the Afghan community. I don't want to deal with it. So, um, so that was pretty much the inspiration was like, I'm not saying we should support like if you don't like people or someone dating a Jew on TV or if you don't like whatever she's doing, I'm not saying you have to like it. I'm just saying like be mindful or or we just need to to, to just not be really hostile and, and harass people and, and attack them for their choices um, pretty much. So uh, thank you for sharing kind of what your article is about for those that haven't um, uh, read it and I think that uh, anyone who gets a chance to, we'll, you know, we'll post the link. The link was up earlier, but we'll we'll post the link again to the um, to the article, and I think everyone should definitely get a chance to uh, read it. And um, also, I know your article touched a lot on, and or I think sparked up a lot of discussion on the kind of the double standards that exist um, when it comes for uh, male versus female Afghan celebrities, which I'm pretty sure we could say translates into just you know non-celebrities as well. Um, so if uh, you know, someone wants to kind of touch on that. Uh, I think a few of you were going to speak to that a little bit on um, on just some of those double standards that may exist, and you know, do you know the the, the male versus female celebrities get treated differently um, in our community? And so, just kind of share your thoughts on that. So we'll go to you first, Afifa. Sure. Um, thank you. Yeah, I definitely think that there's a difference in the way that we uh, that level of expectations that we have for males and females. Um, I think that it's a reflection of our community as a whole, right? Because um, I think that what we see in the media or what we portray in the media is a reflection of that. Um, but I also think that, you know, just looking back at Medina John's article, like, I think it speaks a lot to identity development also. And just kind of, um, I think a lot of the outrage about watching, you know, Dorani Popal on TV was, you know, does this represent me? Um, and I think a lot of people were really angered by that fact that, you know, this doesn't represent me, that's not what I'm like, um, you know, this or that is not okay in my culture, that's not how we practice it. Um, and I think that goes back to a lot of that challenge of where do we see those positive role models of ourselves in the media? Where is that portrayed? Um, and I think that's just kind of a, a root problem all, as a whole. You know, I think that they're all connected pieces. Um, and I think that those negative images really take a toll on our individual identity development and not necessarily wanting to associate or identify ourselves um, as Muslims. Um, and I think that really takes a toll on our individual growth um, and identification of the community as a whole, that we might label ourselves as Persians or, you know, not necessarily acknowledging um, our religious faith, if that is a religious faith. Um, 
So I think that's definitely a part of it, and I think that's part of our process of acculturation in the community also. Um, and I just wanted to say a little bit more, um, probably about that in a bit, but I think Dawood also wanted to jump in on that as well. So John, go ahead, and then we'll go to Ali next. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think the issue is, like, you guys mentioned it earlier, like, about because she was a female. If that was a male doing that on TV, like, I don't think people would have that big of a problem with it. Like, it's it's weird because you'll see Afghan guys boasting about relationships they've been in, and it's not a problem to most people. Uh, I'm, and then, like, if you hear an Afghan like female has been in a relationship, it's like shunned and she's looked down upon, and like. I think if the roles were reversed and I was an Afghan guy working for the Kardashians and was getting famous off of their name, I don't think it would have been an issue. I think it's just because she's a woman and our our community does not like to see that for whatever reason. And we'll go to uh, Ali John. Oh, Ali, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Sorry about that. Go for it. <laughs> um, uh, you know, there's a lot of really interesting and important things, and there's my mind's going in a different, dozen different directions. But I want to talk about this kind of gendered um, representation, right? Like, who represents us, who doesn't represent us. Well, we don't agree with so-and-so's lifestyle, so we're going to nitpick and tear at them. But what we don't realize is that when people are in the public eye, we don't have to necessarily agree with what they do, their choices. But when we do argue and say things like, um, oh, that's not part of Afghan culture, or so-so doesn't represent me, then what we're doing is we're replicating the very process that reduces and essentializes us. The media portrayals of Middle Easterns, of Afghans, and of Muslims is part of a wider tradition of Orientalism. It's a literary tradition. Edward Said wrote about it in 1978. And it's something that has now become part of mass media to a greater degree. And part of the root of uh, Orientalism is that it essentializes and it otherizes, reduces the Middle East or the Orient um, in, in, in a way that makes it wholly other. So when we reject diversity within our own community because we don't agree with it, then we replicate that very same process. We give fodder to that type of um, essentializing and reductive cultural logic that goes into representation. So it's very, very important for us not to fall into that because eventually we will start to internalize those um, stereotypes. And this is why when movies like Rock the Caspa and, and the show Tyrant, these other kind of representations, say that they're doing something revolutionary in not showing Muslims, Afghans, etc., as terrorists, they're actually not doing anything revolutionary. They're simply more subtle in the way that they essentialize. So yes, Afghans in Raqqa Kaspa were not terrorists, but at the end of the day, they still were wholly other. They were reduced to caricatures of who they really are. There is no diversity. So it's very important for us as a community to support that, di that diversity. It's one of the strategies of eventually taking down the representation that's being done by white men, predominantly white men, about Middle Easterners and about Afghan. We need to push back against this kind of chaste woman and warrior male mentality because when we uphold that, when we uphold that, we are allowing that Orientalist narrative to really become crystallized in media representation. And I yeah, and going gonna, back on. Go ahead, um, <laughs> yeah, and um, and and kind of to to go off of what Ali John is saying, like in terms of how we want to be portrayed in the media, that word "we" is so broad. Like Afghans, and and I really found this after attending the Afghan American Conference, and after my article, you know, got a lot of um, attention. Was is that we are an extremely diverse people in terms of what we want to see and how we also live our lives in terms of you know like there's a lot of variance in terms of how how muslim how muslim people think that like like how they practice their religion so people who practice islam more may want to see something different whereas you know afghans who who are not practicing as much want to see something else so we also are i i feel like i feel like we just kind of have to be mindful that there's a lot of different things that we all want to see, but the main 
the main thing that I'm seeing is we just really want to stay away from that stereotype of being jihadis or of being, um, you know, backwards militants or whatever that case is. I think we can all agree on that. But I feel like we just need to be mindful that what I may want to see on TV is not what you want to see on TV or vice versa. Or I may or I may feel like I can relate to Durrani more than someone else can relate to Durrani. And neither of that is wrong. Um, it's just really a matter of like all of us being open to that and being okay with that and really just opening our hearts to the fact that there's different there, there's just different desires and, and different types of people in the community and I think that that's something that makes us a really beautiful community so we should use it to our advantage that you know we're not we're not homogenous and we're not all painted by the same brush. Um, Afisa, I think you were going to um, chime in, and then we'll go to Reza after that. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I wanted to comment on was um, just in correlation to what Ali and Medina Joan were saying, you know, in terms of um, is it a step up to not see ourselves portrayed, um, you know, in this role of, you know, and it's particularly just men being terrorists, right? Again, there's that gendered piece where, you know, men are portrayed in a very particular way, and women tend to be portrayed in a very particular way. But I think it's really important to acknowledge why do we see that. Um, and I think that is also a reflection of our wider culture, right? Um, and in terms of how we um, associate with Middle Eastern with Muslims um, in the media. And I think that it's definitely, a, you know, it's important to recognize that culturalizing the violence is a way of dismissing it, right? So when it becomes a facet of our culture, when it comes, when it, be, it becomes deeply imbued in, um, you know, how our culture is represented, it becomes part of, you know, what's placed on our identity as well. Um, and I think it's really important to acknowledge that, that it's a means of dismissing and it's a means of um, really minimizing um, our experiences as a whole. And I think that's why people become so angry about it or where that built-up frustration comes from. Um, so I did just kind of want to briefly comment on that, that it is important to ask why, why it is that way as well. And we'll go to Reza. Um, I actually really loved uh, Manina John's uh, point about accepting the diversity of our community because we are an excruciatingly diverse community and I use that word excruciatingly for uh, a reason because it more often than not tears us apart. Uh, someone who identifies as Pashtun may not necessarily like all of the Pashtun representations in uh, popular culture. However, someone who identifies as Azara who may in their past have experienced oppression at the hands of a Pashtun in Afghanistan will be looking at those popular culture representations and say, yeah, you know what, I saw that, I agree with that. And then there's that tension, right? There, there's that inability to come to the table and forgive each other for our forefathers' mistakes and say that, you know what, you weren't the hand that slapped and I was not the hand that kept uh, feet away from you so we can talk to each other, right? There, there's this, um, and I don't, I, don't, I don't think it's anything unique to our immigrant diaspora, I think this kind of discussion and this kind of uh, sort of psychic trauma from our past exists in every immigrant community. However, that does not excuse us for still participating in it. And I think that we have an opportunity to stop participating in it and to use the diversity of Afghanistan to ask for, and I hope this sort of transitions into a conversation about solutions, to ask for less laziness on the part of Hollywood and on the part of Afghan television as well. Because the thing is, when I watched, I, I had never watched uh, Dash Dolls before this conversation. And I decided to watch a couple segments on YouTube. Uh, and one segment in particular affected me. When I saw the, um, the girl, her name is uh, Durrani Popal, and she was being given a gift by her boyfriend. I, it doesn't matter that he's um, Jewish or not to me. What matters is the way in which the show was edited to create these long pauses in between the boyfriend and the girlfriend to sort of focus and hone in on the whiny girlfriend trope that uh, Durrani was inadvertently or consciously participating in and to focus in on the sort of shocked, exasperated, rich boyfriend trope that her significant other was also participating in. And all of this was constructed not around her Afghan identity, not around her Persian identity. It was constructed around lazy tropes that 
people who make this stuff, producers and editors and directors, think sells, when in fact it doesn't necessarily have to. There are plenty of examples where a majority person of color cast can make millions upon millions, in fact billions of dollars. Fast and the Furious is a franchise that may not be known for its stellar plot quality or its stellar characterization, but it does have a majority person of color cast and it makes billions of dollars, right, across the world. Uh, and it's not like Hollywood is immune to recognizing when pe persons of color need to be cast into roles or need to be involved in projects because look at the power and pull of a place like China. The demographics there demand more Chinese actors, demand more Chinese representation, and so you see in every Marvel movie there has got to be some shoehorned in uh, Asian character actor that is, is, serves as representation. All of this is to say that there are ways to demand less lazy portrayals on the part of Hollywood and to say as well that the issues that we are facing as a community don't just lie in the fact that we are a subset of a minority community. They lie in the fact that the gateways to representation are held by lazy gatekeepers and we can and are capable of asking them to make better stories, to do better by us. It's possible and it has been done. Thank you, Reza. And um, on Facebook, there was a question addressed to you, FIFA, about um, some of the comments that you made in regards to um, the, uh, the the double standards that we have. And you talked about how they are um, representations of kind of what exists in our culture and what exists amongst us. So um, the question was asking, you know, just how do we how do we address the points that you made on on the role models that we see in the media? and um, just on our identity development. So if you wanted to just um, talk, speak to that briefly. Sure, yeah. I think um, I think the question, like you said, is in particular, if I understand it correctly, is um, in terms of where do we see positive role models of ourselves in the media, and, and how, do, how do we address that, how do we work with that? Um, and I think really, I mean, it's similar to what we see modeled in other communities, right? It's going to be positive reinforcement and voicing qualms when we have them. Um, I don't think, as Ellie John said, that you know we are a small community. We are a relatively small population in the U.S., but yeah, we still have a great amount of power um, and influence in that. And I, I definitely think that it piggybacks on what others have been saying that getting involved in the industry in a um, in a moral and proactive way, um, I think, is really important. Um, and supporting that, you know, I work as a community college counselor, and um, and I think that I definitely see a lot of that push in terms of career development and in which areas we're shuffled into, right, like being an engineer, being a doctor, we tend to be, um, you know, we tend to frown upon those who go into the arts, um, and I think that's a really important thing to address in our community as well, um, is providing support and supporting positive role models when we have them. Um, it doesn't always have to be on a grand scale, um, but when we see it, to um, encourage it and to you know, teach people what that looks like. Uh, and I think we'll transition to um, to talking a little bit more about you know what can we talked on just uh, just representation whether it's in the arts um, in the media whatever it may be what can we do to kind of um, what are the solutions to these issues that we brought up and and, and some of the struggles that we're we're talking about here so um, Sabah I don't know if you still had a comment uh, but we can go to Ali first and then if you still had something we'll get back to you right after. I'm really interested in hearing what, what Sabo John has to say because I think her and I are usually on the same wavelength. So I'm very interested. Um, there's really three things, and these are things that you can that other um, communities have done. Um, and I have to say that we live in very interesting times because never before has there been um, a great equalizer like the Internet. So we have tools and resources that are available to us that previous generations did not. Um, sometimes we think of, for example, social, social media activism as not real because it participates in the virtual world, but that's something that we shouldn't uh, be doing. For example, just recently, um, the Islamic Studies and Muslim community had a Twitter storm, a hashtag storm, where against all male panels. And um, male allies, like myself, agreed to never serve on all male panels, and women pushed back against it and, and created a list of competent female speakers who can replace male speakers, so this idea of there's no women speakers, and it was all done on Twitter. 
They didn't meet outside of an embassy. They didn't meet outside of a university. It was done on Twitter, and it had tangible results. So the first strategy is social media connect. We all have social media. We all have Facebook. We all have Twitter, but we don't use it very effectively. Um, like one of the things I do is I log on to my Twitter. I'm not very good at Facebook. My apologies. And I go to the Afghans that I follow, and I make sure that I favorite, I retweet. And this is a way of creating kind of buzz. If you have 100 Afghans tweeting about the same thing over and over again with the same hashtag, it generates buzz, and it creates a pull. More and more people start to discuss that. We could have easily done this with Rock the Casbah or any other type of representation that we don't have an issue with. Two, represent... Support the representation that's out there. People like Kais Esar, who is a musician. People like Ali Baluj, um, Dorani Popal. All these people need some form of representation. They are out there. If you don't agree with someone's lifestyle or whatnot, don't tear them down. Find other representation for you to support. It needs to be productive. It needs to be generative. So support the representation that we have out there. And third, make sure that we work across fields. So people that are in media need to be working with people that are in politics. And people in politics need to be working with people who are activists and people who are academics. Because we need to create an intellectual community that relies on one another, works alongside one another, so that we can change the narrative that's out there. One person isn't going to do it. One actor isn't going to be able to do it. But if we have politicians that, that support it, if we have people that will simply say, I'm not going to buy that movie, if we have writers, if we have academics that are consulting, if we have all these different people from different fields working across their little areas, we can generate a great deal of change. Saba, so putting you on the spot. Did you still? Um, I'm so we're kind of at the juncture we're talking about solution-based. Um, how do we deal with this and how do we solve the problem? I mean, um, I agree with everything you said, I John, as you already knew I would. Um, but I would say that number one, when it comes to reality TV, we need to recognize that. Um, that reality TV is not necessarily meant to dissect, um, you know, Afghan American or minority identity issues. Number one, it's not meant to do that. It's not meant to even humanize minorities per se. Um, it's really not meant to reveal much at all. Um, not any different than any of the other previous reality TV shows. But to also recognize that. T television and film, the arts and the entertainment industry does have the power for their listeners and their audience to for them to for them to have some sort of empathy for the people that are portrayed. And um, there's a lot of power in that. And I think that with that, it requires um, on our end to you know, like Afifa John mentioned, you know, give positive reinforcement where it's needed, where it, you know, where it deserves it, but to also um, call out when, you know, we're seeing, you know, poor portrayals of us and poor depictions of us and to encourage those who are entering into the arts. Um, I would also, like, one, one thing that I will point out is if anyone's familiar with Scandal, and um, it's written by Shonda Rhimes. She's an African-American woman. She, um, She's also famous for, what is it, Grey's Anatomy. But she called out um, the writer for Gilmore Girls, which was pretty popular um, back in the day. And Gilmore Girls, I mean, it was a great show. It had a female lead role, mother-daughter you know, scenario. But it was extremely homophobic. And it was extremely, um, it, it had poor representation of minorities. When they did present minorities, they presented it in what Ali would call an Orientalist fashion. And so when we're talking about solutions here, I would definitely say, number one, for the portrayals that we see of Afghans, specifically Afghans, since we're talking about Afghans in the media, Afghan portrayals to not be so Orientalist, to not be seen as such these others of like weird and passive um, roles, but um, and to hold hold that accountable. But also, I would say that um, for to to demand and to encourage there to be more Afghan lead roles, and until that proverbial playing field is actually level to reserve those lead roles for Afghans. Because um, that's not what we're seeing and that was one of our, our biggest comments when we saw that. As far as, you know, these gender double standards, um, you know, that's the reality like it's in our 
you know, whether it's in Sava, I think the we're losing you a little spotlight. bit. Whether you're in the spotlight or not, um, as a... Sava, John, I think we may or may not have lost you, but uh, welcome back if you, uh, if you do. Um, <laughs> But in terms of uh, just one one thing that Ali John also brought up, um, you know, there was some some folks who, uh, I believe it was last year, Walmart had this costume called Pashtun Papa, um, which you know was a really obviously you know a really offensive costume, uh, with someone with like a uh, with like a big beard and a turban wearing like you know a pin on tamban. And um, uh, some people reacted to it on um, on Twitter, and um, and I think it, it turned into something that uh, Walmart actually responded to, and they said that it was something that they had. Uh, it was, I guess, it was never in the stores, but you know, they, there was some action that was taken, and the fact that Walmart even responded to it and know, knew that they had to respond to it directly, I think, was really uh, a really great step forward, and kind of speaks to some of that social media activism that um, Ali John was speaking to. Um, and Sab, I think we have you back. Did you want to f wrap up what you were, what what you said, what we missed, and then we'll go to Medina after. Sure. Um, so, I think I don't remember where I got cut, but um, when I was talking about, for example, Shonda Rhimes, the writer for Scandal, she called out the writer for Gilmore Girls for her poor portrayals and for um, not having enough minority lead roles and etc. And I think that that's perfectly acceptable. I think that that's needed, and we shouldn't shy away from that. But we can also encourage when we do see positive portrayals, um, and to cut some slack on you know Afghans when they do reach a level of celebrity status. I think we put a lot of pressure on um, our brothers and sisters when you know when they try to make it in the industry, and we have a lot of expectations out of them. And I don't think that's necessarily fair, you know, and. As Madina John talked about, she said that you know we all have different backgrounds and we all have different expectations. Some might want more religious, like you know, religious portrayals, and some might want more liberal portrayals. And we just have to recognize that these are just people living their lives. You know, Dorani Popal is, you know, yes, she's Afghan, she's born Afghan, but she's a fashionista and she's on that show for you know that purpose. She works at a store. And Ro Habib, who was on Million Dollar Listing for San Francisco. Yeah, he's Afghan, but he's a real estate agent, and we just have to recognize that there are multiple roles that we play, and that we should we should cut our people some slack and and encourage them to be successful in their fields. And Medina John, we'll go ahead to you. Yeah, um, I'll just make this short, but but yeah, exactly what Saba John is saying is in terms of you know cutting some slack, and then also really really encouraging people when they do go into the arts. Our parents are some of the hardest parents around, and they want us to be doctors, lawyers, and engineers, and that's it. So if there's an Afghan out there that is trying really, really hard to make it in the entertainment industry, it's up to us to really, really support them because they are already going through hurdles. They're going through, through the hurdles of trying to break down stereotypes to whatever their own personal... Uh, personal struggle was to get to that role, and then you know the expectations from from our, our 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 families. There's not very many Afghan parents that you know when their kids born, they're like, oh, like I really really hope that that this person becomes a really famous actress or an actor. Are there some parents that are out there that are cool like that? I'm sure, but you know as soon as there there are Afghans who are you know and and you know, in time that our generation's getting older and, and we're gonna we're gonna see this more. This is gonna happen more. We really need to make sure that we are backing them, supporting them, watching their movies, sending them tweets, like small things like that. Um, it really, really goes a long way and I feel like it'll want more people to pursue the arts and there will really be like a removal of that stigma that surrounds um, Afghans pursuing pursuing uh, jobs in the entertainment industry. And Nora Chang, we'll go ahead to you. Sure. Um, so I've been reflecting a lot on what we've said, and I think one of the biggest tensions we're bringing up is this, how do we humanize the Afghan experience without essentializing and falling into the trap of essentializing? Because it's what we see happening with Afghans is what's happened with Asian Americans, with Indians, is we've been racially lumped, right? And I think the biggest victims in this and it's, it's probably a poor word, to, poor word choice here, is women. And, and in terms of when you talk to people and they're like, oh, I didn't know you were Afghan. I'm like, what do you think an Afghan woman looks like? People get this blank look on their face. 
And then they're like, oh, in a burqa, there's this magazine of a woman with her mouth taped with mask tape, right? So for women, we are like Afghan women particularly, we're really given no agency. We're not even given a role. Like with the silent, behind the scenes, like um, person that needs to be saved, right? That's the role that we've been given. And I think the biggest thing is humanizing our experience, but particularly for Afghan women, we have to really, like I said, uh, like Madina, Madina John said and others said, we have to even if we disagree with the types of roles we, that are around, we have to support the women that are there because the fact that when you ask people what does an Afghan woman look like, they just look at you confused, it shows the role that they have. They're like silent. You know, the men are portrayed in a very vilified form, but we're, we're, we're sort of this victim, and that's just the only role that we've really seen over and over. We have to go to Afghan, and it plays into foreign policy, it plays into politics, so this entire system. So I think that a lot of what I'm think, leaving this conversation thinking about is how do we humanize our experience without falling and, and embrace the diversity within it too. And uh, Reza, we'll get you five seconds, ten seconds or less Snapchat of your final comments, so go for it. I just wanted to quickly build off of and give practical steps um, based off of what Madina and Afifa were saying about encouraging kids to go into the arts as Afghans. Most of the time our parents say, how? How are you going to do that? What are your next steps? And we don't have an answer for that. And I think the best, single best answer is to find a community of artists that you can uh, be a part of who will critique the art that you put out. If you are a writer, find a writing community. If you are a singer or an, a musical artist, find a community that will be able to critique and put out the music that you create and the songs that you create. If you are a filmmaker, find a community that will be able to critique the art that you create and then also post it on their own YouTube channel. Basically, find people who are willing to build with you and then keep you on a disciplined, rigorous schedule. Lay that out for your parents. Tell them that I have this, this, and this planned out for this, this, and this week and I'm going to accomplish them. And then at the end of that, that, and that week, you show that you have accomplished it you will convince them, I guarantee you. And I, I think that those are some practical ways in which Afghans can break out of the doctor, lawyer, engineer mold. And I think um, the last thing I would just say to wrap us up is just, you know, continuing to both challenge and support, I think is what we talked about. It doesn't have to be either or. Um, we have to do both. And we can't be scared of challenging, but we are, and we also need to support. Those are both things that we absolutely have to do as a community. And I think it's very important that we do that and we don't shy away from that. Um, it's going to look different for different people, what, how, how people challenge, how people are supporting, but um, it's definitely needed for our community to move us forward um, and, to, and to progress because if we, if we want to answer the question of what do we do, how do we change things, we have to do both. Um, but that's just my opinion. Um, and I would like to just thank everybody for joining this panel. Um, everyone who joined us is some special, uh, special guests from all over. Um, and we'll continue this conversation on... Uh, on the Facebook event page and if you have any other questions, comments, feel free to post on there and please continue these discussions and continue to, to talk about these things in, in your own communities, within your circles, within your friend groups and if you have anything, any suggestions or thoughts about this, about the Samuel Network that you want to tell us, please feel free to reach out to anybody here um, and let us know, okay? But thank you all for, for joining us tonight and we wish you all all the best. Thank you. <laughs>